Okay. Yes, and I was going to introduce her after you call the meeting to order. Okay. So it is nine o'clock on October 22nd, 2020, and I'm calling uh, the meeting of the District Diversity and Equity Committee uh, in order. Um, Please go ahead, uh, Ms. Millen, and introduce our new, your new uh, assistant. Yes. So, hi, good morning, everyone. Happy Thursday. So, I am proud to announce that Jessica Seals, who is with us today, is joining our uh, Department of Professional Growth. She's joining our team um, as the new Executive Administrative Assistant um, for our department. Um, as you know, Cindy... And um, doing double duty as she transitioned and has been working at Polo Park uh, Middle School. So she has onboarded. Uh, Jessica spent the whole week last week. We made sure she was onboarded properly for a whole week. Um, she's transitioned well with um, Cindy. Cindy sends her hellos. Um, and today is Jessica's first DDEC uh, meeting. So I just want to say welcome. All the correspondence will now come through Jessica along with calendar rights or anything like that. And she's also going to, to just to transition fully from what had been sent out through Cindy. She's going to make sure everyone has the most up-to-date calendar invites um, for the future meetings so that therefore all those meetings will now be under her ownership on the calendar invite. So just expect to receive those and welcome Jessica. Thank you. We welcome you, Jessica, to our team, and uh, you have big shoes to fill, <laughs> but I'm sure you do really, really great. Um, and so we will move to the roll call. I, Jessica, do you have the list of the members? Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for that introduction. Welcome. Uh, Dr. Miriam Glamad, IAT in Action. I'm here. Jacqueline Calloway, Coalition for Black Student Achievement. I'm here. And just one quick, uh, um, I forgot to say, could everyone make sure you mute your mics or mute your telephones if you're calling in, just so that we can minimize the background feedback. It interferes. So if you're not speaking, could you please mute? Thanks, Max. Hey, uh, this is Jackie Calloway. I am here. Thank you, Ms. Calloway. Uh, Amanda Kennedy, Compass. Present. Rex Barnes, Compass. Bobby Howard Davis, Division of Blind Services of FDOE. Suzanne Cordero, El Sol Jupiter. Kimberly Spiro, ESC Advisory Committee. Present. <laughs> Carla Donaldson, ESC Advisory Committee. Reggie Duran, Children. Here. Reggie's here. Thank you. Sue Davis Killian, Gold, Gold Coast Down Syndrome. Lucia Barnes, Guatemalan Mayan Coalition of PBC. Maria Antunia, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Present. Dr. Joaquin Garcia, Hispanic Education Coalition. Rachel Mondeser, West Palm Beach NAACP. Marsha Guthrie, West Palm Beach NAACP. Evelyn Vargas, Puerto Rican Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Ms. Vargas, you are here. I couldn't hear you. Juan Pagan, Puerto Rican Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Presente. Buenos días. Terrence Reed, Urban League of Palm Beach County. Carrie Whittle, FAU card. Robin Jones, FAU card. 
Present. Good morning. Good morning. Charmaine Postal, Palm Beach County Council of PTAs. She will be uh, late. Good morning. I'm present. Oh, you're, you're here. Good morning. Ms. I am present. Thank you so much for calling the meeting to order, Dr. Glamaud. Um, I will continue to allow you to proceed with the rest of the meeting as I am taking care of a matter, but I am on the call. Thank you. Cassandra Corbin Thaddeus, Palm Beach County Council of PTAs. I am present. Good morning. Good morning. Mary Evans, Tri-Cities Education Council. Eddie Rhodes, Tri-Cities Education Council. I'm here. Joseph Sanchez, Black Chamber of Commerce. I'm present. Um, I'm going to have to skip out um, for part of the meeting. Okay, thank you. And is Emmy Kenny on this morning? Okay, and that will conclude the roll call. I believe. Oh, I believe a few popped on while I was doing the roll call. Hi, Rachel Mondes here, NAACP. Good morning, Ms. Mondes. Good morning. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. And I also wanted to welcome Emmy Kenny. Uh, she is with the Palm Beach County Human Rights Council. She will be observing this morning. Hello, everybody. That's me. Good morning. And hi, Dr. Glamad. This is Sue Davis Killian, Gold Coast Down Syndrome Organization. Good morning. Okay. So, Jessica, do we have a quorum? All participants are now muted. Yes, we have 12. You're good. Okay. Um, and thank you, Charmin, for joining us on the call. I know you're going through a difficult moment and all we are all prayers with you this morning. Um, so um, we are going to move to the approval of the September uh, minutes. Has everybody have a chance to read the minutes from September? Mm -hmm. From the last meeting. Okay, so any, um, do I have, uh, do I have a motion to approve the September minutes as is? Motion. Second. Okay. Minutes have been approved by Mr. Pagan and second by? Robin Jones. Robin Jones, thank you. So we are moving to the next item in the agenda, the update from the assistant superintendent for Ms. Millen. Um, so Ms. Millen, are you ready for your presentation? I am, but it will be just a little different today. We have some good news to share. So um, I'm gonna turn this portion over to Ms. Starks. Um, the reason I say that is because she's going to give us some equity updates, some of the equity work that's been taking place in the district. But I think it's important before we move into the protocol um, that I give my time to Ms. Starks to actually frame the context so that when she goes into the protocols around uh, having courageous conversations about race, you'll have context as to what we have planned in the district, what's been happening in the district around equity, and some of the new things we just got new information about. Um, the only one announcement I'll make is that we did find funding for REI, Racial Equity Institute, this school year. So excited. Um, and we will be able to off continue to offer um, those training sessions. And um, we'll have eight this, yeah, we'll have eight this school year. The contract is in progress now to be approved, the routing process it has to go through to be approved by the board. So that's one piece of good news, but Ms. Starks, is going to give you the background of culturally responsive teaching, the background of culturally responsive leadership, where we are. You requested to know how many have registered and how many have taken the course. She has that information. And last but not least, she has information um, to share with you about how this has now branched out from just the work that she's doing and is being 
um, starting to um, be led in different departments across our district, which is our goal. All right, Ms. Starks, I'll turn it over to you. Good morning, everyone. I am actually really excited to be here to share a lot of the news that we have going on in equity. So um, I have not been attending the meetings because I have been doing whew, a lot, a lot of culturally responsive teaching and culturally responsive leadership training. Uh, as of today in culturally responsive teaching, I have about 330 people who have attended out of about 435 people who have registered. Um, this course entails the teacher track. So with the teacher track, it starts with an introduction to culturally responsive teaching. That kind of lays the foundation of having the conversation, why we're having the conversation, talks about a lot of things that go into the classrooms, like name, pronouncing names, uh, cultural norms. Uh, so we talk about a lot of those things. Then we go into bias, not bias, I'm sorry. Uh, we go into the courageous conversations piece where we start talking about our racial narratives and our cultural narratives. We start sharing a lot of perspectives along with the uh, protocol. So the courses are really, really embedded in this protocol that you're about to partake in here in a few minutes. Uh, so it follows the, the track all the way through. Once we go through bias and microaggressions and how to change those narratives and how to kind of see those in ourselves, we go into trauma. Now, when I go into trauma, I look at different aspects of trauma. I, I look at our trauma, our personal trauma, because this is really a personal journey uh, for anybody who is embarking in equity. It's really, really important that you get to know yourself so you can sustain this work and also be open-minded to getting to know other people, other cultures, other races, um, other ethnicities. So we, we really have that in-depth conversation. So when I get to trauma, it's important for us to know what our triggers are, um, what are the elements that come, come with trauma, how do we respond to trauma, uh, and then it lends us that lens of how the students are going to respond to the outside trauma that they're getting or current or past trauma. Then we're going to go into uh, pedagogy. What does culturally responsive teaching pedagogy actually look like? Uh, and then we go into equitable behavior. So there are some cultural and some racial norms when it comes to behavior. So we kind of touch on those pieces and how to be equitable in our behavioral norms or behavioral management in our classrooms. So that's the culturally responsive teaching course. When we get to the culturally responsive leadership course out of about, I want to say 200 individuals plus, uh, 113 people have attended the culturally responsive leadership course, which has been running slightly um, less than the, it started, it started after the culturally responsive teaching course. Let me give my verbiage right. Uh, so CRT was going maybe two months before culturally responsive teaching, so I want you to keep that in mind as well. Um, so we have about 113 people who have participated in this culturally responsive leadership course. Now, the leadership course mirrors the uh, teacher's course. Why? Because we are going on a journey together, but teachers have different aspects that they have to address in the classroom. So when I go to the leadership course, I'm not really addressing classroom just yet. So the first three courses are very similar to course two, three, and four in the teacher course. So they start with their racial narratives, their cultural narratives, getting to know who they are, um, why they have not been able to talk about race or culture. So we look really deep into those conversations, looking at the different perspectives again. Then we go into microaggressions and bias. So this course leads right into that microaggressions and bias, just like in the teacher course. Then we go into trauma. So it's important for our leaders to know that they that they may have experienced some trauma in their past or even currently, and how are, how is their body responding to that? And then we lean into how the students respond. Then we go into, now that we know our racial cultural narrative, our biases, our microaggressions, and our trauma, now we're gonna go into equitable practices. And that is the equity, inclusion, and diversity course, where we start looking at how are we going to start embedding this work now and then we go into our culturally responsive leadership strategy. So now that we know all four of these things, how do we actually embed some of these things and become more equitable and inclusive inside of our environments? So that is the culturally responsive leadership course. So the good news is, uh, since some of these departments, our departments have, have partook or partaken into our um, the first course, 
they kind of got the juices flowing. So they are starting to think uh, of tracks that they can create on there uh, to, to accent what I am doing. So I have met with a few departments and they are on board with the whole equity team idea that I have uh, that I'm really, really working on right now. So I have spoken to Carlene. So my big idea of what I'm pushing out or trying to push out is the idea of an equity liaison or an equity team. I have two schools who, who have reached out to me. Dwyer Middle School has reached out to me and Seminole Trails Elementary School has reached out to me. And Carlene doesn't even know this, but yesterday I actually met with this Seminole Trails equity team and we did what we're about to do today. So I'm already starting to work with some equity teams, already giving them some of the pillars that they need to look for to be equitable in their schools. But what I'm telling them is there's a track that I'm looking for when we are building this equity work. So this is what my lens is. Of course, it's gonna be modified and all kinds of things once I get people in it. But I have spoken to uh, Multicultural, which, um, uh, Harvey is here. So I have spoken to Multicultural. So what they have agreed to do or kind of putting in their mind is, which they have already have is the tiering of the cultures. So now that you've been with me in culturally responsive teaching, now you'll be able to go in Multicultural and look at the different cultures that you can, that, that you want to learn about, Haitian culture. You can go in, in um, that department and they have a whole PD on the Haitian culture or the Mayan culture. So we're looking at tiering these different cultures so it can complement what I'm doing. So follow me. So what I'm trying to do is create these different tracks. So equity liaisons or equity teams for the first year are gonna get all introduction courses, right? So they're gonna see me, they're gonna see uh, the, the multicultural department. I have spoken to Dominic Grasso, who is also looking at doing um, like a race-based analysis through literature. Phenomenal course, absolutely beautiful course. Um, then we have uh, Safe Schools who is doing a behavioral track. So remember when I talked about behavior, there's racial norms, there's cultural norms, there's ethnicity norms. So he is looking at, so there's a person who is looking at, Greg Murphy, who is looking at how to track behavior out so we can start looking at the different entities of behavior. Now, when we look at equity, equity is across the board, right? We're looking at different areas of equity and how we're going to embed this in. So I looked at Gregory Murphy reached out to me to do a behavioral track. So that is going to complement that my course as well. Then I talked to Brian Knowles. So Brian Knowles is going to come on board as well to create or embed the tracks that he already has when it comes to the four mandates, the gender studies and LGBTQ. So I'm looking at some of those courses also to be embedded into the equity track as well. Um, I, Kristen Rulson, who is the manager of social emotional learning, she is on board as well. Her and I have been working very, very closely, uh, making sure that our cell standards, our social emotional learning standards are in line with equity. We have been <clears throat> uh, embedding ourselves in the castle convening to make sure that our equity and our social emotional learning competencies align with each other. So her and I, she's, had, uh, she's created a social emotional learning equity track as well. Um, that was part of her post assignment when she took the culturally responsive teaching. Um, good morning, Ms. Starks. Am I missing something? I thought the district had some time ago established equity leaders on teams that were already distributed at all schools. Are these new teams or were they previous teams never activated? I'm not sure I'm going to have Carlene answer that. I'm not sure. And whoever is, um, for that context of that question, I'm not sure. We always had a goal um, several years ago that we wanted to do equity liaisons. And Miss so uh, Miss, Miss, Miss Carlene, I don't mean to um, cut you off, but if I could ask all public comments, I'm not sure if Nicole R is someone, uh, is a public comment. If I can please ask that all comments are done. I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Glamad. Um, if I can ask, please ask that Ms. Starks finish her presentation in its entirety and then hold all questions until the end because we don't know what the presentation is and I don't want it to become where we're answering questions and the presentation never gets to the end. So Ms. Starks, if, uh, if there is no objections for the committee members, 
we can go ahead and um, complete the presentation in its entirety and then hold all questions until the end. And uh, public comments, please wait until the appropriate time. Okay, no worries. So, um, where was I? Uh, so I've been working with Kristen Rulson on the social emotional learning aspect of equity and how to embed those things in. Um, I've also worked with the mental health department to track out trauma. So when I say track out trauma, uh, complex trauma, simple trauma, witness trauma, uh, epigenealogy trauma, um, trauma informed culturally responsive strategies and trauma. So they're looking at tearing out these different aspects. So once they took my course, they realized they had uh, a stake in, in equity and what can they do to actually improve our collaboration between or amongst each other. So we came up and I'm also reaching out to uh, William Stewart to bring in the ESC 504 disabilities as well. Um, so I think it's really, really important that whenever we talk about equity, we look at the whole gamut and then start to educate individuals on those certain spheres of equity. So we, I'm looking at having these different departments and I, I met with Dwyer and Seminole on those um, equity teams so we can get the ball rolling and start. So they're really, really enthusiastic about having these meetings and having these discussions when we talk about the whole totality. Yes, 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 yes. So that is what um, the update for the equity of what I've been working on, what um, some, some things that are coming down the pipeline uh, and how I plan on having this, this uh, equity become uh, really, really embedded in these equity teams or equity liaisons. Uh, I did explain to the individuals that I met, there will be some accountability pieces that we will be looking at, but as a team and as uh, uh, Carlene and I still navigate through that. I'm still looking at what we can do to better that initiative, but also how we can also uh, conform to the entire gamut of equity. Um, Ms. Starks, could you um, share with them the meetings we've been having with Dr. Fanoy and his strategic initiative team so that around that work that we're doing with him? So Carlene and I have been meeting with, the, with his team, with Dr. Fanoy's team on the strategic plan and how to build it out completely, but also having the input of uh, uh, some of the, the, the streamlining that we're going to do between the teachers and the district as a whole and making sure that equity becomes embedded and in part of everything that we do um, whole totality. That includes some of the, the trainings for our board members, some of our trainings for um, our teachers, our district leaders. Um, there's one aspect that I'm also looking at is trying to create a track for parents as well or community members as well. So I'm looking at a whole lot of those things that will streamline with Dr. Fanoy's um, strategic plan and how we're going to embed equity as a whole totality. Okay, thank you Ms. Stark for your presentation. Um, this is really good to know that the district is putting action behind their philosophy of equity. It's not just talking about it, but it's something being done. So I'll open the the floor to who, who everyone who has questions, anybody who has questions. And also, do we have any uh, members of the public on the line with us, if they can identify themselves? So no one from the public? Okay, so any questions from the from the members? I have a question, Dr. Yes. Calloway. Um, who is um, on the strategic uh, strategic plan team, Dr. Fenoy's plan uh, team? Who are the members of that team? We're meeting with the planner. So, for example, uh, Kathy V. You know, Miss Kathy V. is the the point person for framing all of the. Uh, people that will be on the team. So our meetings have been with Dr. Fenoy and Kathy V because they're in the initial stages of planning like the skeleton of who will be involved. So that's the part we're on, but because equity is gonna be the center and the focus of the strategic plan, they start, we started meeting with her because the first uh, part of it is to start the board workshops that board members requested. So we are right now is Dr. Fenoy and Kathy V they go back after they take our input and framing of it and then they're having she set up who those teams will be. Thank you. 
I have a question. Uh, this is Cassandra Corbin Thaddeus. And Keisha, thank you for the presentation. Super helpful. Um, just a quick question. Of the 300 teachers that are so teachers that have um, taken the training, are there, are they, as a part of that training, um, creating or um, planning some type of artifacts so that it is, when you say embedded, like where, how does that actually manifest itself? So what I've done is their post assignment is a lesson plan of the culturally responsive teaching strategies that we talked about in the course. So if they're not a teacher and they're, let's say they're a guidance counselor, then they, um, then they are to meet with their teachers and see if they can solicit um, a lesson plan where they can modify. So if they can modify it to meet the culturally responsive teaching strategies that we talked about or the nine tenets that we talked about, or they can set up a PD. So a lot of people who came in that were directors and some were managers who wanted to see, like Kristen Ruth who came in, to see what culturally responsive teaching looked like. So what she did is she created a PD that talks about the culturally responsive tenets within her social emotional learning aspect. So they were, um, their artifact is to submit a lesson plan with a student's artifact with some of the activities that we talked about or making sure that those culturally, uh, that that activity is culturally responsive in that aspect. And I do look at uh, uh, all of them to make sure that the lesson plans are embedded with those culturally responsive teaching strategies to make sure that we're embedding it because that, absolutely great question. Why I wanna do that is because when the equity teams or the equity liaison gets there, then the teachers are already starting to follow their lesson plans so they'll be uh, more apt to encourage or to even embed some of those culturally responsive and equity uh, mindsets whenever they get to that, that portion. Um, if you, uh, Jessica, can you unmute Ms. Guthrie? She's on the Nicole R call. She would like to ask a question. Thank you. Sure, I don't see which line is Ms. Guthrie. It's the one that says Nicole R. Ms. Guthrie is unmuted. I'm looking at the, um, I'm looking at it. She is unmuted. Uh, Ms. Guthrie is your, she's unmuted and it looks like the three dots are there. Um, is your phone un, uh, I mean, is your particular device unmuted? Or is your speaker all the way up? Because I see the dots that as if you were speaking or you are on. Maybe there's a speaker phone on your phone or um, I believe it's F7, um, F6 or 7 on your keyboard that. Okay, this is a new question by text and then yes. you can answer it. And her question was above um, when I had said, wait to the end as well. That was the equity team question? Yes. So the equity teams that were, um, that were before or that were talked about, they have not reached out to me. I'm not sure what their equity teams look like. Um, I know I was told that some schools had equity teams or equity liaisons. Those individuals have not reached out to me um, to let me know that they have equity teams to start working with them. What I have started to say in my culturally responsive leadership courses and the culturally responsive teaching courses is that if any school is interested in having equity teams to please reach out to me so we can start the work and start that, that, that uh, pre-work uh, before we get into the actual meat and potatoes of the equity liaison work. So as of the other schools, I don't think that they solidified their teams or you know, with everything going on, they have not reached out to me. I'm really not sure. I just know the two schools who reached out to me who are, I have standing meetings with them every two weeks to make sure that we are on board with the three pillars that, um, or the pillars that we're looking at in order to be culturally responsive and equitable in our practices. So I hope I answered your question. And I was gonna say, and for full context, prior to Ms. Starks joining our team in January of this school year, um, of this year, 
we the two years ago, year and a half ago, we had the desire to have equity liaisons in every school. We took a field trip down to Broward um, County School System to find out about the work that Ms. Starks was doing because she had over 300 something equity liaisons reporting to her in her in that in her previous district. And we went to see what that could look like. We took that field trip with our current Lisa Almashi at that time, Dr. Robinson and our equity team, because we wanted to try to see how is that working? How could we mirror that here in our district and then break out from equity liaisons to full equity teams in every one of our schools? So I'm thinking that that question, I'm, I could be wrong, but I'm thinking the context of that question is coming from when we started to do that work, not ever knowing that Ms. Starks would end up being our manager of equity and access. However, she was the she was the one I heard about when we did the research for the vision to have an equity liaison and eventually an equity team in every school. And that started back in 2019, 18. And we went to Broward when we found somebody's actually doing this work. We actually ran into Ms. Starks at a conference. So I hope that gives context because I think that might be where that question is coming from. I think the question was more so, um, I, I don't remember the, the question in itself, but if you look in the comment and read that question again, I don't think that's where she was going. Um, hopefully she can, can come you, on and can ask. Can you guys hear me now? There, Are yes, you I can me? hear you now. Okay, good. I, I don't know what was happening. Maybe it was something with my computer. No, yes, that's exactly where my question was going, Carlene. It's just that we've heard this strategy explained many, many times. So, yeah, I remember hearing it about two and a half, three years ago. So maybe there was just an assumption that this was already in place at schools and each school had, whether it was a liaison or a team. So when Ms. Starks was sharing it, I was just wondering, I'm like, well, what happened to the teams from two to three years ago? Did it ever not, did it not ever get activated or are these new teams so now you are explaining that it was a vision, but we never actually brought it to life. And I think that just goes with some of the concerns that I have with this committee. Like we talk about so many things. There always are just kind of so many strategies and so many visions. And sometimes we just don't know the pace of implementation. And I think it would be important for us to better understand what is, you know, how are we moving from exploration of an idea to actually getting an idea seated and seeing the results of that idea. I think that's something that this team, this committee needs to, to ask more questions about and, and, and hold lights accountable because we had go, gone out in the community sharing that, oh, the district has these equity teams. I know I've said that before in, in, in public spaces, that that is a, a strategy that's activated and taken place. So to hear in 2020 that we now just have two schools and we're just getting ready to start I think sometimes we get not always the right information or it's painted in a way um, that sounds as if it's something that we're doing and not something that we're thinking about. And I agree. And so for full disclosure, um, when that was announced in 20, early in the 2018, early 2019, we then also lost Miss Almashi. We, I had to go back and write a job description for the two, no excuses, but yes, you're absolutely right. So we're getting back on track. So we did have a setback um, in personnel, as well as having to get two job descriptions written so we could have a manager of equity and access and then lost another position. So yes, you're absolutely right. And we will make sure, I'll make sure, I do a better job of keeping you updated but the vision came from us visiting, and I think that was only a year ago when we visited Broward County Schools to actually see it in action because we actually found someone. So yes, I will definitely do a better job on making sure you, you're updated and you have the most current information. Also, the grant that was going to pay for this idea around the equity liaisons is a grant that our district used differently than what Broward used for theirs. So we thought we had the money, but come to find out our district used the money to pay for the work that is being done on a leadership side. So that state grant could not be used 
to pay for the equity liaisons. But I will definitely, I own that. I will make sure that everyone on this committee is continuously updated. And even though we've had some setbacks, I hope that you took away the overall takeaway is that we are moving forward. We actually, even though we are down to one person officially having equity in their title, we are starting to move the work through the district. Mm -hmm. I will definitely um, thank you for that feedback and I'll make sure that everyone is updated on a regular basis. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. I just appreciated it. I'm, uh, I think the strategy makes a lot of sense and I'm, I'm glad we're getting started. So it, it's just good to know where we are. Thank you both. Uh, this can, uh, this Jackie Callaway, I, I, I have a follow up to that because I, I think that was a very good point uh, question because we do seem a lot in this district to work in silos. So I'm wondering uh, right now, uh, it, has there been or is there, uh, are you intending to have any kind of communications with the um, uh, with the regional superintendents? I mean, where where, <clears throat> where is that connection going? with this so, because what we're trying to do is make sure or hopefully have more schools, if not all schools participating in this. Well, our regionals and instructional superintendents, which is all of our principal supervisors are, are, are part of the leadership development track. And just recently, uh, I just announced today that we received the Racial Equity Institute funding to do that. I just sent an invite out last night to all regionals, all executive team members, um, inviting them along with Dr. Robinson, inviting them to the Racial Equity Institute Phase Two, which is a part of that planning. So they are a definitely an integral part of all of this, um, CRL, but also with Racial Equity Phase Two training that's scheduled to take place pending board approval on November 30th and December 1st. So the two schools that are doing it, uh, who, I, I guess I'm trying to narrow this down in terms of what's breaking up the communication here to get more schools interested in doing it. Those two, two schools, who uh, actually uh, let you, who out of that school, what position, principal, assistance principals, one of the uh, team leaders, who was that communication with? Principal, both of reached out to me, yes. Okay. And principals reached out to you as a result of having gotten that information from you? From course one, yes. So from course one, they were kind of interested in what they can do on their campus to be more equitable. So they reached out to me and ideas of what or what and how to, to make up equity teams. Okay. May I add something, Keisha? And this is um, to Dr. Calloway and what Marshall was saying earlier. Um, and and this, this is actually a, a statement. And I would ask us to push ourselves further than where, what we are traditionally, uh, than how we are, have been traditionally implementing these types of quote unquote strategies. Until this becomes a part of our culture and expectation and not an opt in type of uh, scenario, um, I, I think we're going to find ourselves back here, like as Marcia said, two, year, two years from now. We're going to be doing the same thing because we're looking for people to opt in. We're looking for people to have the title of equity. And if somebody leaves, like what, what happened, we're starting all over again. So I don't, I don't know where, where that conversation happens. Like where is it that it becomes entrenched in part of the value and, and um, the culture of the school district so that it's not optional? So that's all I wanted to say. Um, as a follow-up to what Ms. Corbin was saying, I totally agree with you. It seems that, um, and also the, the principal that will be opting in to this, we're probably preaching to the choir, are people that are already culturally sensitive, that wants to see something better. So I think what I would like to see, if it's not asking too much in terms of transparency, is to know when we're getting the grant, how much are the grants, can we as a committee make some decision on how this money going to be spent? Uh, since the money, if the grant is to equity, that it's not being spent somewhere else, that it's not being used for um, any other agenda you know, that the district may have. And uh, even having like a survey of where we are, how many schools, uh, the state of equity in Palm Beach County in terms of um, even asking students, I know maybe it's asking to, to know 
what's going on, where those schools are. If the students are saying they feel that this 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 not inequities inequities in their school, we should be looking that the principal on their performance evaluation, which I'm sure they do on a yearly basis, that it's done. That this has to be in a section about equity. They are being evaluated on that. That there's got to be a section where th- we have to keep them accountable to that. They are probably being evaluated on uh, if the schools are A or B or C. But let's evaluate them on equity also, and that should be a section of the evaluation for each principal, so that they will think about it. Absolutely, and the policies and procedures as well in the school. I, I think this is probably uh, the most important piece of our conversation here uh, today. By the way, it's not Dr. Calloway, um, but thank you. <laughs> um, but I do think that this, I mean, having worked at a school district as a principal, okay, I, it's oftentimes what we get or what principals, and it's been six years since I retired, okay, is you do get this sense that it's everything is whether or not you want to do it. So it's not showing, it may not be showing from the district <clears throat> that this is a priority. It needs to happen. Everyone needs to be doing it or getting involved in it uh, because it's really unacceptable that only two principals, okay, have reached out for this. I mean, equity is to be, I mean, right now, even we're having discussions about a chief equity officer. But yet here we are, you know, somehow or another, the schools or the principals are not um, uh, being required, okay, to infuse this into the climate of their schools to the extent that they are not even requesting or asking to be a part of this program. And that's really unacceptable. We seem to be working in silos. So my next question, the reason why I ask about who was on that particular um, strategic plan um, team is for that very reason, okay? I hear you say Dr. Fenoy and I hear you say Kathy, okay? But how, I mean, I, I'd like to know how that exactly is working because a lot of times we meet and nothing comes out of it. What is the purpose? How is this going to be going through the strategic plan? Okay, so for two answers to that question, and then we need to move into the protocol um, portion. Um, One is uh, this committee has asked more than one time for these types of opportunities to become mandatory. And we have taken that to Mr. Oswald. We have taken that. So I will once again take that back to Keith Oswald, who is our deputy superintendent that's responsible for our schools and share that concern. The second part is that the initial meeting is just Dr. Fanoi and Kathy V. However, if you, when you, when there will be more information, I think shared is what Kathy V shared with us. Um, when they go to do the board workshops around getting everyone on the same page around the vision for the equity work that will take place in our school district. So then they will be able to tell you who's on the other other teams that they are developing because it's just in the beginning phases um, of making sure that equity is the center focus of our new strategic plan. And as for the grant, the grant that we were going for has already been taken. So in Broward County, they used the grant that they applied for for five years, if I'm correct, Ms. Starks. Um, to do um, five years to do equity liaisons. And that hence paid for the 300 plus equity liaisons that were reporting to Ms. Starks and Broward. When I came back to the district and spoke with Barbara Terimbez, who at that time had all the grants, she informed me, Carlene, you can't apply for that grant because that grant was already being applied for by the district and is already being used in another department. And so therefore, that hence is where the, we didn't get the funding. I couldn't apply for the grant. I met with Ms. Starks when I met her at the conference and found that out. So I will definitely, um, hopefully we will, I'm expecting to have more information around who is going to be a part of that planning. Kathy V would be a better person to ask that question um, as she works with Dr. Fernoy around that. But the board workshops that are coming up also will also give more information. 
But at this time, is it okay if Ms. Starks engages um, the committee members in the protocol or um, is it, am I off schedule? Um, no, actually we are already uh, past the schedule, it's supposed to be at 9.25. So go ahead, Ms. Starks, and we're gonna start with the, uh, the next section of Courageous Conversation Protocol. Okay, am I unmuted? Yes, I am. So we are about to participate in the Real Talk session that has gained a lot of traction um, with the conversation and starting the conversation. So welcome to the Real Talk. My name is Keisha Starks. I am the Manager of Equity and Access. So how did this come about? This came about due to the fact that uh, Dr. Fenoy approached um, Carlene and then approached me about how, uh, this article. So the article that you read, um, I had read it, mm, I want to say maybe two months prior uh, to Dr. Fenoy sending it to me or uh, sending it through um, Carlene and asking the question, can we come up with something where we can start a conversation, at least start something? Uh, and he wanted to do this first with the executive cabinet. So I did this with the executive cabinet and it was extremely successful. Um, but I noticed in, in, in lieu of George Floyd's death, there was a lot of things going on. Um, I was in the process of finishing the trauma course in the culturally responsive leadership track and found myself discombobulated. And that's gonna make a lot more sense when we get to uh, the next slide. But I found myself all over the place on this compass, not really navigating myself very well. And I'm pretty neutral on this compass. I'm pretty, I can have a conversation around any topic and, and, and be neutral. But I found myself all over the place as well. And when I started doing these, these conversations, it was a healing component for me. Why? Because I was hearing other people's perspectives that mimicked mine. Um, but it also allowed me to process what was going on with me as far as the trauma that I was being exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it was the COVID-19 or it was uh, the unrest that is going on right now in our country. So I found myself all over the place and still in that article, found myself right in the middle of the meat and potatoes. So as I prepared myself for this presentation, I wanted to explore my why. Um, so that is one thing that I, I'm really, really leaning towards is my why. Why am I here? Why am I doing these things? Why does things bother me? Um, why am I doing uh, a lot of what I am doing? Well, my why, oops, okay, hold on. But, okay, my why I'm not okay or uh, still trying to be okay. The first reason is my three daughters. So my three daughters, uh, 21, about to be 22, 19, about to be 20, and 13, about to be 14, um, they do show up as black females. And with Tamir Rice and, and the countless Breonna Taylors, the countless other women who have been taken from us so soon, I do see my children in these and I'm starting, not starting, but been having these conversations uh, with my daughters, making sure that they are uh, keeping themselves safe as well. My other why is my three fathers. And yes, I said three fathers. I am lucky to have three of them. Uh, so my first gentleman that you see is the only father I knew up until about eight years old. Um, and then the second gentleman is my stepfather who pretty much raised me for about 20 plus years because he's still very much in my life. Um, and then the last gentleman is my biological father whom I have just met maybe in the past four to five years. So I put them up here because they do remind me of the George Floyd, uh, um, uh, the, uh, I said Tamir Rice and I didn't mean Tamir Rice with the ladies, but Tamir Rice and George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and uh, a countless other gentlemen who have been taken from us so drastically and so soon. So I find myself all over and discombobulated as well. And as you can see, they are men of military, been in the military, served their country. So it, it was very important for me to understand why I'm not okay and why I'm navigating myself the way that, they, that I am. So when we are having this conversation, it's really, really important to set up a protocol or some shared agreements in order to have this conversation. So if you have a piece of paper in front of you, you are going to scribe this uh, this compass that is going to come up. There's going to be four quadrants 
and you're going to scribe because you are going to have um, some a, a journaling activity here pretty soon. And as you are uh, scribing this, this compass, I am going to explain each quadrant to you. So here's the compass, and this is adopted by Glenn Singleton with Courageous Conversation. And I use this protocol in everything I do. I promise you, in everything I do, when I'm talking to my children, whether it's a happy or a sad conversation or it's a, a co um, confrontational conversation, um, whether I'm at the grocery store in Walmart or Publix, I am always using this protocol. It helps me to navigate. So a compass, a compass helps us in our directions, right? Normally, we are emotional beings, right? So we normally respond off of our emotions. What this compass is going to do, it's going to navigate your emotions, it's going to place them, and then it's going to give you time to process so we can start hearing the different perspectives. So you may be in a more quadrant. Your more quadrant is, you know, this is a sense of right and wrong. Uh, you, you have the, a strong sense of that. You may be in your intellectual. Intellectual means that you want to know more about what's going on with the topic so you can make more of an informed conversation. You may be in your emotional quadrant. This means that it might have you feeling some type of way. You may be sad, you may be happy, you may be fatigued. This is going to put you in that emotional quadrant. You may be in the social quadrant. This is you wanting to do something. This is me and my uh, social quadrant when I'm doing my PDs and I'm having these conversations, that's my social. Now, you are going to find yourself at different points, maybe in the same five minutes, maybe in the uh, a span of a week, you may find yourself all over the compass. That is normal. I don't want you to freak out and say, oh, I'm not in one. No, nope. you are going to possibly be in all of them, and that is okay. Um, the goal is, is once you continue to use the compass, you will kind, uh, you will no, uh, start to center yourself where you are more neutral in having these conversations. Now, the second part of the of this uh, of this protocol is the four agreements. So, what are the four agreements? Staying engaged. So when you are staying engaged in a conversation, understand what your avoidance tactics are. The biggest avoidance tactics is this. It is the phone. So if I see you, if we were face to face and I saw you surfing or answering an email through, through uh, during a conversation that is um, really, really heated or um, important to have, if you are on that, then you give me the impression that this conversation is not really important to you. Uh, another avoidance uh, uh, tactic is using the restroom a lot, uh, doing frequent bathroom breaks <clears throat> during a presentation or during a conversation uh, lends to believe that you are not invested in the conversation and it's not really important to you. So we ask that you stay engaged. Experience that discomfort. So you are going to be uncomfortable in a lot of these conversations. I'm asking you to lean into that uncomfortableness so we can start processing it and unpacking why we're uncomfortable. Keep in mind that when you are uncomfortable, you learn more. Think of a time that you were in a situation where you were extremely uncomfortable and you had to navigate yourself out of that. So when we are in these conversations, you may have to experience that discomfort so you can understand why you're feeling that discomfort. So I'm asking you to lean into your uh, discomfort and, and explore why you're uncomfortable, speaking your truth. So today, as you are speaking, you are not allowed to use the we, they, them, us, none of that. Uh, you are only allowed to use your I statements. <clears throat> your I statements are the only thing that I want to hear. Now, if I hear you say we, them, and us, I'm going to politely ask you to stop and just add, uh, continue with your I statements. So you are not speaking for the whole group. You are just speaking for yourself. Expect and accept non-closure. Now, this is really, really important because I know that I have people who are in here who want to know the answers. I gotta know the answers now. We are not gonna get to this, this, solve this issue in a week, a day, a year, two years. This is one of those things where we have to continue to have this conversation so we can normalize the conversation. The third part of this is the six conditions. We are only gonna focus on four, but in the, the tracks, we focus on all six of them. So what is the first one? Focus on personal, local, and immediate. What's happening right now? What's happening in your space? We're normally going to isolate race. Why? Because social construct. In order to understand the multiple perspectives and your social construct, we have to understand how we see ourselves. Example, 
I show up as a Spanish lady a lot. I've been cussed out in Spanish more times than I like to admit. Why? Because people perceive me to be Hispanic or Latin, which is completely fine. I understand their perspective of me. But then, since their perspective is not actually how I see myself, I'm not offended. I do not get offended when I get cussed out because I understand their perspective of me is that I should know my language. I'm not Spanish. I don't have Spanish in me. So I don't know the language. All I can offer is no habla espanol. So when we are doing this, we have to make sure that we are normalizing how we see ourselves versus how people see us. So that's that normalizing that social construct. And then we're going to monitor these agreements and these uh, parameters that we have established as we continue to have this conversation. So you should have your article, you should have your coding, and you should have your compass. So all three of those things are going to be important in the next slide. Are there any questions as of now? I see, can I please put the share the compass in PDF? I do have it in PDF form. I do have it. Yes, I do. So I will share it with Jessica so she can share it with all of you all. So I do have it. Absolutely. Any questions thus far? No? Okay. So let's get started. Let's go ahead and go into our questions. So the very first thing that I want you to do is after reading this article, I want you to locate yourself on the compass. And again, you could be all over the place. You could be in two, you could be in three, you could be in four. But I want you to think about the one that resonates with you the most. Now, it doesn't mean that you won't be able to talk about whatever else is going on with you. That's fine. And I want you to look at which, which one is resonating with you the most. In five sentences or less, tell me why you're there on that compass. We'll give you a few seconds and we'll move on. Okay, so now you should have your compass, your why you're there, your article, and your coding. Now I'm going to ask you to pick one coding. I know you probably coded all over the place. I want you to pick one coding. This one coding is going to be your focal point. It's going to be your talking point. Now, does this mean you can't talk about the rest of the article? Absolutely not. You can talk about whatever it is, but I want you to focus on that one point. You can talk about the rest, but please focus on that one point. Now, this is how the rest of this is going to go. I'm going to put two questions up there. You are going to respond to three. You're going to respond to where you are on the compass and the next two questions that are coming up. You're going to have two minutes to share out. When your two minutes is up, I am going to raise my hand. Now, keep in mind, when you share out, you are not responding to no one in the room. You are not responding to any comments. You are only giving your perspective and answering the guided questions. Any questions on that? So again, you're gonna have two minutes. When I raise my hand, please, please do not just stop in mid sentence. I don't want you to, to five, four, three, two, one, stop. No, I want you to continue your, pro your thought process. I wanna, I wanna hear your entire perspective because it's really, really important that we get your perspective into the room so we can hear where you are coming from and what your feelings are regarding this article. Are there any questions on that? So here are our two questions. What emotions were or are raised or rising for you? And what new learning or deeper understanding occurred? So who would like to go first? I Uh, Keisha, could you repeat the questions, please? What, uh, where are you oh. on the compass and why? What emotions were or are raised or rising for you? And what new learning or deeper understanding occurred? I just realized they're on the screen. I was zoomed in on the compass and didn't see it. <laughs> okay, no worries. <laughs> Okay, 
I'll go first if you'd like. Absolutely. I don't, I don't need two minutes, though. Uh, okay. This is Sue Davis Killing from Gold Coast Down Syndrome Organization. Um, I am on the social part of the compass because I've always been involved in taking action to improve things, and that's what I like to do. It's a good way to hang, uh, handle anger at how things are, is to take action. Um, with the article, what emotions were or are raised for me? Um, just the, the same old anger and everything. It was, you know, I think to this group that you're speaking, probably none of us, none of this is new, but um, I, I think this article speaks to why we're all here and on this committee. And what new learning or deeper understanding occurred, probably the only part that me as a uh, person living with my white privilege <laughs> is that uh, black colleagues may seem okay right now, but chances are they're not. And it's just something that made me stop and think about when I'm interacting with black colleagues who, you know, we're just chit-chatting about whatever, or, um, but I am not, thinking every minute of the day or or aware all the time about the the social injustice going on again because I have that privilege to do that and the fact that it just helped me really really understand or, or really I guess think a little more about how um, it is just a part of daily life um, for my black colleagues Thank you for sharing, Sue. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Kimberly? Yes. Kimberly? Yes. Um, I, um, this, I'm a social emotional point, like if you were graphing it, um, both of those. Um, I felt sadness, a desire to change, and a sense of overwhelm in that I think I still probably don't realize the full extent of everything and definitely before recently wasn't aware of how bad things were. I thought we were moving in a positive direction and not realizing how much more like the tip of the iceberg and how much of the iceberg is under the water and what is there. And I'm still learning that. And I want to help, but seeing how huge it is, is saddens me. And um, it's kind of overwhelming, but I want to work on it. Um, and so that's my thought. And the article I had seen months ago as well. And the people I'm very close to, I've been checking in with them, with people that are associates in that sort of I sometimes am a little, I want to check in and I don't want to seem like this intrusive person who's, um, so I would love to have a conversation about how best to check in and help um, without being this white woman who's privileged, um, who just charges in and does the wrong thing. Um, Thank you for sharing. So I'll, I'll go next, Ms. Starts. Um, uh, this is Dr. Glimmer with ITN Action. Uh, so why am I on the compass? Definitely emotional. Um, and of course, I want to use my emotion to, uh, of course, propel something to do to get into action, of course. Um, the word, my emotion is definitely anger. Um, uh, and also, I uh, it, it, it's, it's very hard to understand what's going on because I think, first of all, um, even though I'm born from, I'm a, I was born in a different country. I was born in Haiti, uh, a black country. So, of course, this is really, it propels so much, so much inside of me. And we're all the same. I mean, I know that sometimes Haitians say, oh, uh, Haitian, African-American, Jamaican. At the end of the day, we are one race. We are one race. And then when, uh, like you're saying, people will look at you and think you're Hispanic. They, I mean, until I open my mouth, you will not know what I am. 
it's when you see I have an accent that you know I'm from a different country. So that propels a lot of anger. I feel angry, resentment. And um, new learning, deeper understanding. Uh, definitely, I, I, I still don't understand. I still don't understand where we are at in 2020. I still don't understand. So a lot of anger, but I don't want the anger to, you know, fest in me, but I want to use it in order to act and to make it better for others. Because I'm, I'm also very uh, fortunate to be in the category, a social category I am in. I'm a professional. I can defend myself. I can do things even for myself and my son. I'm angry that every time my son, who's a 17 year old, take his car, that I don't know what to do, that I have to put a camera inside my son's car to know what can happen at any time. That pisses me off. I have a lot of anger. Thank you for sharing. Yes. Eddie? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me, ma'am? Yes, I can. Okay, I'm Mr. Rose, Tracy Education Committee in the Glades. Uh, I guess I'll, uh, I'm, I'm kind of jumping all over the, the quadrant here. I'm looking at emotional and I'm looking at morals. Uh, the emotional part is, uh, I guess since I watched the school board meeting last night, it, 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 I guess it, uh, it makes me really emotional uh, because of the fact that I, I listen to people who don't even think about the livelihood of a person who have to care for his family uh, just because of a couple of words which a person has apologized, the person has said, the thing was taken out of context, but yet still there are people there want to just crucify the young man and, and just, just destroy him. So that, that, that kind of brings back emotion. And, and, and after last night, I guess we should, if I had this meeting yesterday before the meeting last night, I wouldn't have been as emotional. Uh, as I am now about it because it, it makes you angry to hear that people just for a little mistake that people want to crucify you. They take your livelihood and things of that nature. And, and, and then the moral part of it is the audacity that people don't look at the things that you have done to build yourself as for educating yourself, carrying yourself. Uh, you're out of school, the school is one of the top schools in, 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 the, in the state of Florida. And, and all this is forgotten just because of a couple of words, you know, which was taken out of content. So I guess I'll be moral and, and the emotional and the, and the moral part of it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else? Thank you, Ms. Starks. This is Ms. Guthrie. Um, I, I some days I don't even feel like I'm on the compass. I feel like I'm I, I'm not even in this compass. So, um, because as a black woman, I mean, we're just holding up the world. We're just holding up so many, many things. Um, but we keep pushing the fact that we can just kind of wake up, get out of bed and come on these calls is is about sometimes all all the grace we have and still greet people with a smile, still say good morning. So some days I, I'm not even sure I'm even on this compass in, in any of its quadrants. But when I feel most effective is, is really when I'm, I'm thinking about how I pull on, on each of the quadrants and use them in, in, in my activation and use them to kind of move through my daily life, but also use them to move um, strategies for, for for holding systems that, um, accountable and 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 being active in dismantling white supremacy and and anti blackness and racism. But you can't just rely on one quadrant. You have to really kind of think about how you're using all of them because all are important if we're really going to be courageous. In, um, in the fight for justice. But today, I I'm not even on the compass today. Thank you for 
I agree with Marsha. Um, I typed it in because for some reason I couldn't sleep. Um, some days I'm numb and some days I'm in every quadrant. So. Ditto. <laughs> I don't know who's typing, but you're doing a great job. <laughs> uh, uh, so, me, huh? Go ahead. Hi. Right. Yeah, good morning uh, to everyone. You know, I, you know, being Hispanic all my life, you know, born, raised in Puerto Rico, blah, blah. You know, had the opportunity to work with one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the country, which took me all over the world. So I had the opportunity to work with different races, different people across the board and all that. Even when I was like your father, Keisha, I was part of the Air Force, you know, the, the Vietnam. And uh, I was stationed in Georgia. And because of, uh, we went to, after work hours, we went to uh, a bar, you know, and, and my boss happened to be a guy from California. He was black, you know. So when we got in there, you know, the owner of the bar said, sorry, we don't serve and big, throw in the big N word here. You know, so my, and he was my boss at the time. And he said, guys, because the other guy who was with me was an Italian guy from Jersey. So him and I, we looked at each other and we were in uniform. We were military police, you know, and, uh, and the guy, the boss, Davis, he said, guys, sit down, drink your beer. I'll wait for you outside. And the guy at the same time, the owner of that bar pulled a gun in my face. A shotgun, and that looked like a cannon when you have it so close, you know. And uh, so Pat Fasano, the other guy, and I look at each other. We got that beer like uh, was only two ounces, you know, and we got out. The pleasure was of the next day we came back with the local police and we arrested him, you know. So, but the point is, you know, prejudice is something being around all over. Doesn't really matter where you go because we saw that in, I, you know, we live in Asia. Also, we saw that in Asia, you know, we, I, I managed in Latin America. I seen that in Latin America, you know, so it goes, and obviously here in this country, it's no surprise, you know, and it goes, that's what, when people come to me, and say, where's your accent from? I go, I look at them, you know, my accent, you mean yours? I don't have an accent. Your accent is where? New Jersey, or you're from Massachusetts, or you're from California, you know? So it is all, again, when you look at this compass, you know, I don't know, H give you a pleasure that you look at things very calm. You know, you don't want it to affect you, even though emotionally you feel it because you're not a cement, you know. <laughs> but at the same time, it's how do you approach it and then you turn it around to make it a positive, even if you are in a very hostile environment, you know. And, and again, it's to turn people that at least we can agree to disagree in a normal way in a very social way that is not offending each other or cursing to each other or have to use foul language to get even you know so it is something you know and and sometimes yeah tears comes down and all that well i guess women all do even some men said they don't cry but yeah we do you know but it, it is about how do we handle it how do we approach it and at the same time i'm thinking about the kids you know i have grandchildren so obviously is about them, you know, and my wife and all that. But it's, you know, about those kids, what's going to be in the future? But it's quite an experience, and I feel I learned from it. But the thing is, I'm not done learning. That never ends till the day, probably, I'm six feet under, and it's still, it's still more learning to learn upstairs, up there, above the clouds. So, I don't know. It, it, it is tough. It's difficult. You know, these times are very challenging. And then I'd be glad when the elections are over because this is really a circus right now. But it is about, hey, let's make the best of life we can and love each other. That's why I look at it. And please, by all means, be safe. This virus ain't going away anytime soon, you know. And for those people who want to come to me and say, oh, well, this is like the flu. No, it's not like the flu. You know, this is five times more potent than the flu. And because I was in the pharmaceutical industry, I'm still subscribed to a lot of medical journals. And Dr. Miriam, probably she knows a lot of that better than me. Uh, but uh, I'm still reading all the journals, 
from abroad and the U.S. that I, I'm subscribed to. So, because that was in my in my line of uh, <laughs> my life. But and it affects. Yes, minorities are affected higher than other people, and but also have to do with the role of social issues. You know, and how many families live in the same household and things like that and all that stuff. But anyway, thank you guys. Love you all. <laughs> thank you for sharing. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry, if I may, Maria Antuna. I have to get off at 1030, but if I may, um, I appreciate so much hearing all these stories. I myself was born in Cuba, arrived here in 1962. But I think the most important thing that we must never, never forget is that if we don't continue the mission that we're on, we're not going to do and make changes. Um, so I think it's it's imperative that we as many as of us have the stories, some worse than others, we, that's why we're sitting on this committee for a purpose. And the purpose is to make changes. Um, so we just got to stay strong and we, we have to and do, do not take the eye off the ball. Stay focused on what our mission is and why we're on this committee and what we're trying to accomplish. Because at the end of the day, this group as a unit is what's going to make the change. Um, so I'm, I still am committed to this committee. I've heard everything everyone has said, but I think it's very, very important too, that on the days that we do are down or don't, we, we have to pick ourselves up and say, I'm going to continue this and I'm going to push forward to make a difference. Oh, we're going to do it overnight. Absolutely not. But the little that we can is improvement and not allow for it to go backwards, but forward. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. May I Yes, absolutely. Yes. So to answer the question of where on the compass and why, I put that I'm on the social part of the compass because as a black woman, um, the emotional, the moral, the intellectual, um, I think I've, I've walked through all of those spaces before. I've held, I've, I've spent time in all of those spaces. And I would say I go back and forth between the social and the emotional because I think um, in wanting to take action and wanting to move forward. When you're passionate about things, it's hard not to feel the emotional weight of what you're going through. Uh, what emotions were or are raised uh, rising for you? I feel frustrated, tired, and honestly disappointed. I think a lot of the people who have aligned themselves under the work of racial justice, racial equity, social justice, or whatever title they'd like to put under it. Um, you can't do this work without sitting through the hard facts of it. I think a lot of people are under the impression that we're gonna hug away racism at any level, not personal, not, not systemic. Um, we've been hugging for years. Um, I don't feel also that, you know, I think it's unfortunate that, um, the situation or the, the, the killing of Mr. Floyd in June happened in an election year because a lot of people saw that as a political thing. People dying is not political. It's, it's a life. It's a person. It's a, it's, it's, it's not a political thing. And what year it occurred in, we've been dealing with these situations for, decades, centuries now. So irrelevant to me that it's an election year or that it's political or anything. It is what it is. It's the state of the country that we live in. It's the state of the world that we live in. And it's frustrating and, um, and honestly hurtful to have people continue to just kind of dismiss it. Um, and you learning to stick into the work regardless of the barriers that come up. Thank you for sharing. Anybody want to share before I close out? We have about uh, about six more minutes if you want to share uh, with Ms. Starks before we move to the next item in the agenda. No, I would just like to say that in listening to all of the comments. Oh, pause for a second. Pause for a second. 
are you going to answer the questions or is it in response to everyone else? It is in response basically to what others have said, but also, you know, addressing the question. I hear where you're coming from. Okay. Um, so response and, to questions first, and then the last question is going to give you an opportunity to do what you want to do the second part. All okay? right. All right. So in closing, and that was a perfect segue. Yes. So in closing, what did you hear today? What was an aha moment for you? Something that your co a colleague, some, something that your, your peers said, um, something I said, something that resonates with you that was maybe a couple weeks ago, maybe just yesterday. Uh, Mr. Eddie, I don't see last names, so I'm so sorry I'm not using last names. Uh, but Mr. Eddie was talking about how uh, last night just kind of saw what was Rose. going on. So I want you to think of an aha moment. I want you to think of what you heard today and place yourself on the compass again. Place yourself on the compass and give me five sentences or less while you're there. I'll give you a few seconds to, mon to process that and then we'll move on in our closing. Let's see if I can open up this last one. And Ms. Callaway, I will give you the first opportunity to uh, speak and share. All right, first of all, with regard to the conference, I do wanna say something quickly. And that is, I don't know how you can separate out those four areas on the compass. Human beings are complex and all of those areas on the compass, I think are infused in what we feel about what is happening with regards to equity and racism in this country. But what stood out to me was uh, Ron's comment having to do with the children. And this is what uh, fears me. I have a lot of fear on what is happening with our children, which is one of the reason why, reasons why I think that it should be imperative and required that this district goes through the process of helping teachers and anyone that has direct con uh, contact with our children. Because what we are trying to avoid, and I don't know if we can do it in our lifetimes, is to prevent our children from having to go through this this feeling of, you know, I, I the way that they are being treated, the way that uh, uh, they are discriminated against, the way that assumptions are made at schools that they have to walk into every day. I call these schools sometimes a war zone. So if, if the district is not taking the kind of leadership or if it's random, which right now I feel that it is, we're not really gonna get to the point where we can begin to help children. So that's really what stood out to me in today's conversation. I mean, we, we've been through this, we know what it's, like, but what we're trying to do is to put our kids on a different track. And the only way to do that is to change the way that people interact with other people based upon, not upon race. And I know that this may sound kind of high in the sky, but this has to be addressed very deeply and it cannot be something that is optional within the school district. And I think that that's one of the roles that this committee can play and then not accept halfway uh, gestures at completing something or having meetings or having teams. <clears throat> they have to indicate or show that they are meeting the objectives that we would like to have uh, met. And that has to do with the entire district. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Mr. Eddie. So, in closing, because I want to respect your time. I was taking notes, you probably saw me writing, so I was taking notes because I try to capture what everybody is saying and bring it into uh, a wholesome uh, and streamline it. So what we are hearing is a lot of trauma that's still being triggered. So you are being triggered by what is being seen on TV, what you are watching on social media, what you may be seeing on the computer. 
So with us being triggered, we have to be mindful that sometimes the trauma that we are, that we have been exposed to or being exposed to is going to cause us to look in different aspects. Hence why I put you on the compass because it, it, it kind of navigates your emotions and has you process your emotions so you can speak to them. Now, again, like I stated in the beginning, you're not gonna find yourself in one quadrant. You're gonna find yourself all over the place but there may be one quadrant that you are resonating with the most, right? So yes, we are human beings that go into and should experience all of these, but there may be some issues or may be some things that are presented to you where you find yourself in one quadrant, quadrant more than anything else, or you might just solely be in your feelings and that is perfectly normal. What I wanna say is the generational trauma that we are seeing today is being really, really manifested. So when we talk about our children, our children have already been traumatized over and over again by certain things that have happened in their lives. But I also want you to keep in mind that generational trauma manifests itself every day in every generation. This is also manifested through epidemi epidemi epidemiology trauma, I'm sorry. So there's certain things that take precedence in what we're experiencing. And a lot of times it's out of our control. And that goes more towards the students. But what we don't realize is as adults, we still don't process our trauma in a healthy, proper way. And we are still walking around with our triggers, not understanding why I responded this way or why this is bothering me. So when we are talking about this whole totality, the only way that we are going to be able to sustain this work is to continue hearing the perspectives that come into the room and create that empathy for individuals as they show up in their different spaces. Again, just like this article, we all are going to show up in different spaces. I don't care if you're black, purple, blue, yellow, if you're Asian, if you're Haitian, if you're Mayan, you are still going to experience a lot of these issues. So I hope that I have given you some strategies to continue this work or to at least start self-reflecting and start processing what it is that you are looking for um, in having these conversations and sustaining these conversations as well. So. At the end of this, here is my information. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please reach out to me. I want to thank you for all being transparent and being present in the conversation. Thank you. Thank you again, Ms. Stock, for this awareness exercise. Uh, definitely, it helped us look deeper into ourselves and also, and I think it also helped us understand why we are in this committee, why we are doing this kind of work. And uh, because it's it's really something that we're passionate about, and also because we want to see uh, we want to live a better society for our children. Um, no matter what happened to us throughout our lives, we are doing something better to for the next generation. So that brings us to the next item in the um, agenda, and it's a committee discussion, uh, the unfinished business. And uh, and also the item to consider for the next meeting. Is there any uh, unfinished business, uh, Miss Millen? That's something that we have not. Um, let me see. That we have not yet. And anybody, anybody in the committees, and anything that we have not yet uh, uh, go over that we're supposed to bring up for the meeting today. Nothing, Miss Millen. Are you still there? Yes, I'm, I heard. Yes, I'm still here. Also, uh, while we're thinking about things that we have not uh, addressed in this meeting, I really want to bring back, uh, and I heard Ms. Guthrie and I heard Ms. Calloway about the metrics, about uh, the fact that we are giving the options to principal whether or not they want to participate in the equity and have an equity liaison in the school. So I want to see if we can bring to a future uh, meeting something related to a metrics where, where we can, our action, there can be more action toward what we're doing right now. In certain, instead of of saying, okay, this equity, this school will choose to have an equity liaison person or not, which we know the school who needs the most will not ask for it because chances are the principal in that school probably is oblivious, is, is unaware of what's going on. So I would like to know, and I'll see what you, uh, the other members of the committee think, is there any way that we can have an impact on the 
performance evaluation of the principal so that we can somehow that equity is not an option that equity is uh is a must it's not whether or not you want to be aware of equity because every school have at least a percentage of, of students that are from the Hispanic community, the African-American community, LGBT, um, all the different diversities. Every school have these kids, so it's not an option. So I'd like to see, since we cannot uh, force it on them, is there a way for us to evaluate them on so that they can become aware part of their evaluation has to do with equity? I don't know, Ms. Millen, or anyone else in the community want to weigh in on this. Okay, my my way in would be this. I think that one of the things that we need to consider is actually making presentations at the school board. I think this really needs to be come out in the public that this is something that we feel is extremely important. As you say, there needs to be metrics. It should not be optional. It should be considered to be as a part of the evaluation. Clearly, this needs to be publicized. And that puts people on really, they have to respond. They have to do something. So if several people came out and at school board meetings and just address these areas in a very firm manner, it would put it out there at least. That's one thing that I think that can be done and should be done. I have a question. Thank you. Um, the question is during our I'm sorry, during our previous meetings, um, and I want to say the last meeting before we went out with COVID, there were, we, we took equity policy. And when we took the equity policy, we started breaking out the metrics that this committee stated that they wanted to monitor. Is there any way for us to get back to that and include exactly what you just, everyone just said as one of those metrics? because the committee had been doing really great work um, in getting that narrowed down. I think Charmaine had it all typed up on a spreadsheet and we went through the pol equity policy line by line and pulled out the pieces that we were going to monitor. We have not gone back to that since it's been a few months and I know COVID has happened. So because we know equity is defined in our policy, as uh, action and outcome. And I've heard this committee several times say they want to see action. We were on that path to actually starting to monitor those pieces that this committee stated for their constituents that they go back and serve and regard putting it all together for all students in that actual spreadsheet. So is there any way for us to get back to that? And that would include everything that everyone has just described and we will, that is our monitoring plan, but we also monitor the policy in which this committee was so bit, so um, um, engaged and responsible for getting us to the point where our district does have an equity policy. So is that a possibility? Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree with you, Ms. Millen, that we need to have that. And I think that's something also we can ask with Charmaine, I know she stepped out of the on the call, to see if we can have a standing line in our agenda that has to do with the metrics. That is not, that's something that, I don't know, 45 minutes of our meeting that we know that even though we discuss different things, there's always a part about the action that is being done. And the metrics being one of them, that is a standing, standing, um, um, line in our agenda on a, on a monthly basis so that we are always aware that we have to measure our outcomes. Ms. Guthrie, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say I agree with adding the metrics and I guess I wanted to ask a question for clarification. Is, um, um, is there no expectation for a, 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 as a competency measure in the current evaluation that equity is a is a competency factor in, in the current performance evaluation, whether it's of principals or teachers or all district staff? Is that not commonplace currently? As for evaluations, the evaluations are current, the system for evaluations that uh, principals are evaluated on are currently already set by the um, by the state that we have submitted for the last few years 
for how they will be evaluated. I can bring a copy of what that is, but as for evaluations, those evaluations are done by the principal supervisor and the instrument that they use has been approved by the state that has already been approved. So I don't know if that answers your question, but- well, I understand that there's a standard instrument there is in most organizations. I'm just asking if equity is a competency for measurement in said instrument, or do we not, do we know, or do we not know? Yes, there, this is not um, the essence of the leadership evaluation tool. However, the, the components that we are trying to strive for when it says all students is in the current evaluation um, tool for principals, yes. Okay, well, if you could just share it, because I think in order to get to evaluation, you have to have a, a, um, a standard that this is a competency that that we want to lift up, that that should be clearly articulated and outlined. So if it's not there, then we'd have to do some some work, some advocacy, some accountability planning in order for it to get there so that then once it's included, then we can see whether or not it's being um, enforced, carried out, whatever language you want to use. Um, but I know a, a lot of uh, organizations are working through competency-based performance and adding some expectation around around equity, right? Um, and so I didn't know if it already exists or it, or, it, or it doesn't exist or it exists, but it's kind of implied and not explicit. So yes, sharing the tool would be helpful for us to determine what we want to do moving forward. So I will have, I will have Jessica send that to everyone on the to a copy of the blank evaluation tool for principals. Okay, thank you, Ms. Millen. Thank you, Ms. Gothry. Anyone else, any comments uh, regarding what we want to see? So we all agree that the next meeting, we will bring back the metrics. Can Jessica send to us what uh, I think uh, Ms. Uh, Charmaine Postel has already done so far? If we can have an email prior to the next meeting so we can look at it. Yes, um, actually, I will, um, yes. Is the Excel spreadsheet that the entire committee gave input? Hey, and everyone. I will, oh, perfect. Charmaine. I'm, um, I'm sorry. I'm in and out of the call um, because I'm actually not, I'm sorry. I'm in and out of the call, but I do hear what's going on. Um, unfortunately, I'm taking care of a matter, like I said, um, but we certainly can add that portion. Uh, the matrix was supposed to come back in um, as in November anyways. Is supposed to come back on our uh, agenda. Okay. And also, um, the other question was, as far as the matrix updates, I can send that updated spreadsheet if Ms. Stills do not have it. Thank you. Yeah, Ms. Stills would need it. If you send it, she can send it out today, um, Charmaine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so is there anything else that uh, the committee would like to see on the agenda for the next uh, for the next meeting? I also know that there are some subcommittee. Uh, there is the chief equity and inclusion uh, subcommittee for the, the, the job description. And also there's another subcommittee um that uh, related to the biz equity and businesses that i think they've had their meeting and they're continuing the meeting so should we also have the, the agenda maybe in a 10 15 minutes where the subcommittees are reporting back to the committee so what they have done so far and um so we have a so we have a section regarding what the subcommittee has done so far Everybody in agreement with that or any comments about that? Okay. In agreement. So then with uh, with the next, and if Charmaine wants to um, to weigh in this, if she wants to see that the sub for the next meeting, we have the subcommittee also reporting back. Um, as far as the subcommittee goes for um, job description, uh, Ms. 
Ms. Kimberly, are you able to give an update on that? Sorry, sorry about that. We have been working through um, using samples from um, other policies, um, other positions um, that exist in nonprofit entities and other schools. Um, we're kind of looking at what is out there and what is working and taking the pieces we like and building our own proposed description. Um, and we haven't completed that process. We are scheduled to meet again, maybe next Thursday. I think so, next Thursday. Yes, so we will be able to um, probably, we may be able to present um, a proposed draft by the next meeting, um, hopefully. Yes, thank you. And I know that there's also the subcommittee regarding the business and equity. I don't know if Ms. Mr. Pagan, are you in that committee? Yes, I am with Marie. Marie, well, it's part of that committee, subcommittee too. So yes, we met, we discussed some of the basics, some of the things that we need to recover. Marie, you want to add anything else? Marie Sanchez. He's muted. Okay. Oh, he's not paying attention. <laughs> One of the two. Uh, but yes, we, we touch bases, so we we decide we're going to be reporting again. We could do that for the next meeting. And if I understand correctly, the next meeting is going to be November nineteenth. Correctly. Um, Jessica, is that the case? I don't have in my calendar. In front of me. Job description uh, for job description is September thirtieth at noon. Is uh, I'm sorry. Yes, the chief of equity job description. That is our next meeting. October 30th at noon. Okay. September 30th at noon for the job description and subcommittee, the, the subcommittee and the business com subcommittee is also meeting. Is that ongoing for the business subcommittee also, Mr. Pagan? Correct. Okay. I'm looking at my calendar. Fine. Actually, I don't have money. Yeah. So November 13th is the next general meeting for this body here. And when is November 19th is the next general, the committee, I mean, the full committee that we have right now, that is the November 19th. Somebody mentioned the November 19th date. That's our next meeting. Okay. Just for we'll be sending those calendar right time. All right. So the subcommittee will have a standing uh, line in the agenda to just report for the next time. Give it sort of two, three minutes to just say what we have been working on so far so that we have other work we do in between. And I really think it was great to have this article to read before the meeting because just meeting once a month is not enough. And I know that all of us, we are busy because we all have different jobs and also personal things we have to take care of. But I think having doing a few little things uh, before the meeting, such as looking at the metrics and then being prepared for the meeting that would help us move forward to an action in just staying and talking about things over and over for months and months to come. Um, so if, unless anybody has another comment, we can, any uh, public comments, anybody from the public in this meeting? Nobody from the public. No, uh, Jessica checked the recordings just to double check to make sure if we had any public comments that were, that were called in. And at the time that she checked this morning, there were no public comments. Okay. Uh, um, I, I just want to make a final comment. Yes. And that is that I'm hearing a lot of process oriented stuff, wow. you know, as we're talking today. Uh, and I, I really think that it is very important that we give ourselves some timelines with regarding different objectives or goals that we want to have accomplished. Otherwise, we're spending month after month, okay, dealing with just process, okay? And it's not actually going anywhere. And that's the kind of thing that happens throughout the district. We have committees, we have strategic plan and everything is all process. Number two, I think it's extremely important that this goes openly before the board. I said that before. You want to get that message out, whether or not it's things are happening right now at the district. You, what we're trying to do, what needs to be done, is to influence. You want to influence 
of your opinion or our thoughts. Okay, and the only way that we can influence board members, superintendent, is to really be out there at these board meetings talking about these issues. We don't have to wait until, yes, it's great to look at the metrics, et cetera, but we don't have to wait until that is completed in order to share, okay, or to emphasize that these are things that are really important that we think that need to happen within the school district. Certain things don't need to be option, optional, et cetera. We can start that now. So I just wanna emphasize that, um, that it's important to publicize what our I think we lost her. Miss Calloway. Hello? Can Miss Calloway, are you still there? I'm sorry, my my, my uh, internet shut down for just a moment. Okay. There. Sorry about that. It came back up. Um, I just think this at every board meeting, there needs to be some conversation taken to the board on what it is that we believe that the board should prioritize with, when it comes to equity. We should not miss a month doing that. If I'm not mistaken, I think Ms. Postal has been going to the board. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Millen, that she has been going to do presentation to the board on a monthly uh, basis and that yeah. she is on the agenda for her to represent the DDEC uh committee and and possibly what we can do as a committee is to let her know what exactly we would like her to present at the next when is the next board meeting miss millen so well they have a special meeting i think they announced uh last night um that will be um november 2nd but based on what you just said dr Lamont, you're absolutely right um charmaine um and i met Send information to Carol Bass. Sure. The EC committee has a standing um, portion of the every board meeting to report out. We, we did exactly what you're proposing um, in our last meeting, and Charmaine took everyone's feedback on what she was going to report out to the board, and she reported out to the board last night on what our last meeting suggestions were. So that is already in place. And to make sure that it happens every board meeting, Carol Bass has accepted Ms. Charmaine's suggestion to have DDEC on the board agenda. Comments from our committee every meeting. Thank you. And what I think we can do, Ms. Calloway, is to send Jessica this. If what we would like uh, Ms. Charmaine to present for us, just send her a line so to make sure that it is presented to the next board meeting on November 2nd. And if she cannot make it to the November 2nd meeting, uh, I will myself uh, make sure that I could go and represent the DDC meeting so that we have a voice at the board meetings. And we will present that. And as you're saying also, Ms. Calloway, we Regarding the timeline, it is important. If you don't have a timeline where you want to do something, it is just a dream. And the difference between a goal and dream is that one is vague and the other one is a specific time. And you're totally correct that we need a timeline because we've been meeting for for years now and, um, and having a timeline to each of these metrics will definitely propel us to do something about it. Um, so I think um, the next time we, we meet in the agenda, having that, and we can decide at that time when we have the metrics, what timeline we're giving ourselves to complete what needs to be completed and, and track even ourselves because we ourselves have to respond to, have to show some outcomes of what we're doing. We're not, we're not meeting just for the fun of meeting, but we want to see that something's happening also. Um, uh, any other... Dr. Clement, I just wanted to remind everyone, when we set up the list, we went down, for example, ESC, we were monitoring, we, we stated we were going to check the data around ESC, around placements, to see if there was a disparity with the number of, of children of color being placed. So I want everyone to remember that when Jessica Seal sends you the spreadsheet that shows the metrics that this committee put together, at least to where we got to, where and we're going to monitor. We said that we will be setting up, first we will find out what our current state is to see if it's a disability. 
Once we identified the disparity, we would then talk about what are the solutions for changing that. And those reports would be some of the reports that would definitely be reported out to the board after speaking with whoever the contact person is for that department to find out if it is being addressed. So I just want us to remember when you get the spreadsheet, it, we had this conversation about what we were going to do and it's exactly what Ms. Calloway described as well as Dr. Lamont as, um, described. So just keep that in mind when you get the spreadsheet and now we just need to stick to it so that we can see that through because those are some of the reports that were going to the board after we identify what the disparity was, how bad is it or, or what direction are we going with it? And then what you, this board wanted to recommend in regards to influence to see the change. Um, and if I can, this is Sue Davis, if I can add to that, um, if I recall last time we were working on the matrix, it was not yet complete as far as choosing all the metrics. And what I would ask is that when you look at the matrix, and then think and then look at the equity policy and look at the parts of the equity policy that are your particular area of expertise. Like, for example, I look at the parts related to disability because I know what those metrics are and, and where to get those. So look at the parts that are your particular area of expertise and think about if there's a metric that needs to be added to the spreadsheet that we have not yet started tracking. Thank you, absolutely. And uh, so it is 10.51, unless anybody else has any comment, any questions, um, I will. I would like to, uh, if I can get a motion to adjourn the meeting. Motion. Can I make one, can I make one more comment? Uh, yes, go ahead, please. Hi, so um, Pete Stewart, I work with uh, Brian Knowles in the Department of African, African American, Latinx, Holocaust and Gender Studies, longest name in the district. And um, just wanted to mention that at last night's board meeting, uh, in addition to the wonderful report that was uh, made by Ms. Postel, uh, we also had um, Marsha Andrews read the entire LGBTQ History Month proclamation. Proclamations usually don't get read anymore but this was important enough for her to read the entire thing before the board voted on it. So, and that's my specialty. So just point of information for no other reason than we're about to adjourn. All right, thank you so much for this comment. Uh, so can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion. Any second? Second. All in favor? All right. Meeting adjourned at Meeting June at 10.52. Thank you and see you next time. Thank you, guys. Thank you.